Hello, stats friends. All right, this is a huge lesson. So this one is actually going to be broken up into four parts, and hopefully I took good enough notes so I can tell you when those breaks occur. Um, but in section 3.2, we're going to be talking about least squares regression lines and all of the cool features that come along with that topic. So I am also trying my new little clicker here, which of course is not working. <laughs> so we have our learning targets and they are numerous like we talked about. So regression lines, uh, we're referring to linear relationships between two quantitative variables. So we talked about that in the last section. So our regression line summarizes the relationships between those two variables, but only in a specific setting when one variable can help explain the, you know, the behavior of another variable. So an idea here, we have a scatter plot, and then we are able to fit it to a regression line, which hopefully will help us uh, determine behaviors of points that we don't know, and we can make prediction values. We talked about that again in the last section. Um, re remember the regression line um, is, okay, it kind of goes over it again, <laughs> describes how a response variable y changes as an explanatory variable x changes. So the regression lines are expressed in that form, that little notation, we call that y hat, and that is the predictive value um, for y. So what we're going to see later is we might have actual data, and how does that compare to the predictive data? All right, context, 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 guys. Make sure everything we answer in this section has lots of context with it. And you'll notice things that seem horribly mathy and algebraic, um, because of the context we're working in in the problems, they try to kind of incorporate that into your problem itself. Even the equations look a little strange. So here they're asking, asking us about uh, using our math to make some predictions. So we have a random sample of 16 used Ford F-150 Supercrew 4x4s. Okay. Uh, they were selected amongst those listed for sale at autotrader.com. The data shown in the table for these data, the regression equation is the predicted price equals 38,257 minus 0.1629 times the miles driven. So they're claiming that there's a relationship between the number of miles driven and the predicted price of the, the truck. Um, logic tells me, you know, that kind of makes sense that there's an association there because the higher the mileage, you know, usually the price goes down in the vehicle. So predict, they want us to predict the price of the Ford F-150 if it's been driven 100,000 miles. So what you're going to notice here is because they want us to predict, we're going to be using our prediction line, or at least regression, or our regression line, I should say. So here's the equation that they gave us. And then what they did is where it says miles driven, they replaced that or substituted in the 100,000 miles, and they did some calculation. So the predictive price for that truck would be 21,967 based on our data and based on our regression line. So can we predict the price of a Ford F-150 if it has been driven for 300,000 miles? Well, I mean, mathematically, sure, we could take our equation and we could substitute in 300,000, and we get this. We get the, the truck is worth negative $10,613, according to our prediction model. So first of all, that doesn't really make a lot of logical sense. I wouldn't go buy a truck and then like the person pays me to take it, typically. I mean, that's kind of weird. Um, so what's going on here? We've done what's called extrapolation, where we've used our regression line for a prediction that's much further out than the x values that we actually had in our data. If those of you who are a car owner, you might realize 300,000 miles is a very large amount of miles for a typical car to have. Um, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but that is a lot. Um, so maybe the issue is the line is not a good predictor for trucks that have that really, really high mileage um, for this obvious reason, because it, according to our model, it's negative, and that's weird. Sorry, the phone's going off, of course. Uh, so here's a word of caution. Don't make predictions using an X that is super beyond either direction um, where your data comes from. So if our data was very specific, like in within a, a domain, I should say, because it's X's, I can't extrapolate far beyond that. I mean, I shouldn't, I should say that. It's probably not a good fit at that point. All right, the idea of residuals. So in most cases, no line will pass through all the points on the scatter plot, um, unless you have an absolute perfect fit, which just typically doesn't happen. So because we use the line 
from y to predict uh, to predict y from x. The prediction errors we make are errors in the y or the vertical direction of the scatter plot. So when you look at a residual, um, it looks like this. So they're showing how far off the predicted y or the, the y value, the height, is from the line itself of where we predicted it to occur. So the vertical distances are called the residuals, the leftover variation in the response variable. Okay. So a residual, and this is important, it's the difference between the actual value and the predicted value. And then because it's a difference question, it's a subtraction question, we have to go in that order, actual minus predicted. So the notation in stats is we use y minus y hat. Remember y hat is the predictive line, the predictive y value from the line. So same data about the truck and blah, 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 data shows, blah, blah, blah. Calculate and interpret the residual for the truck that was driven 70,583 miles. So the reason they gave us this particular value is because we actually have raw data from our data for a truck that was driven 70,583 miles. So what we're going to do first is we're going to find the predicted price based on our equation, regression equation. So using our equation and substituting in that number of miles, we get a predicted price of 26,759. Now, find the residual. We actually know the price of the truck according to this data that it was sold for at that mileage. So we're going to take the actual price, which is straight off of, oops, sorry, I'm getting another phone call. I'm going to pause. Okay. So the um, actual price we would take, take straight from the data. It was sold for 21,994 minus the predicted price from the regression equation. And we get a residual, and signs are important. So watch your signs. Why is this not going now? Come on, buddy. I swear. There we go. Uh, the residual is negative $4,765. So label because it's money. Now let's interpret that residual. That's important. The actual price of this truck is $4,765 less than the cost predicted by the regression equation for a truck that was driven that number of miles. I don't know why they didn't actually flat out say that number of miles. They just kind of cheated there. I think we should put the context in if we were answering this. All right, so let's give this a try. This is a check your understanding from our textbook. We have um, some data collected at the weight of a male white laboratory rat for the first 25 weeks after birth. So then we're gonna have a scatter plot where y equals the weight in me measured in grams, and x is the time since birth measured in weeks. And it shows a fairly strong positive linear relationship. Someone had calculated the regression equation. So y hat, the predicted y value, the predicted um, weight, is equal to 100 plus 40x. And it does fairly well, it says. So they want us to predict the rat's weight at 16 years old. They want us to calculate and interpret the residual for a rat that weighed... Um, 700 grams at 16 weeks old. So they went ahead and told us the data because we didn't have that, right? And then should you use the line to predict the rat's weight at two years old? And then we'll talk about that in a moment. So pause the video, jot down some thoughts of your own. And in a, a moment, we're going to show you the answers. So the first question was about um, making the prediction. So using our equation, substituting in 16 weeks for the age of the rat, this model predicts that the, gra uh, the rat would weigh 740 grams. Uh, I'm not real good with like grams. I know like a gram is like a paperweight. So I don't know. And I really don't know anything about rats. So, All right. The second question, calculate and interpret the residual for a rat at 16 weeks old. So the actual data for 16 week old rat is 700 grams. But using our um, equation, if we were to predict it, uh, apparently it's 740. So 700 minus the 740, the actual minus the predicted, is where they came up with this negative 40 grams. So the way we interpret that is the rat weighed 40 grams less than the weight predicted by the regression equation at 16 weeks old. So that's how we interpret residuals with context. And then the third question, which I forgot, is that should we use it to um, represent a rat who's two years old? So remember, age is being measured in weeks. So if we think about that, that's 104 weeks for two years, right? 52 uh, weeks times two. 
According to our model, we would predict the rat to weigh 4,260 grams. Now, they had to go and convert this to something that we Americans would be more familiar with. That's 9.4 pounds, which is like a, a big baby. Again, I don't really know a lot about rats, but if I saw a rat the size of a baby, I would hope that's unusual. Okay, so they're claiming this is an unreasonable result if we were to extrapolate that far out. And we don't know how far out their data went. They didn't really tell us that. But, I mean, if you think about any animal, besides humans, of course, <laughs> um, I think by the time they reach two years old, like, there's a slow, a slowing <laughs> of their growth. Um, again, I don't know a lot about rats, but I'm pretty sure I don't have rats that are 10 pounds. I don't know. Maybe we do. Anybody out there know about rats? Tell me about it. Okay. So let's interpret the regression line. So the regression line, again, is a model for our data, just like our density curves were models. The y-intercept and the slope of the line um, describe what this model tells us about the relationships between those response and explanatory variables. So this is where the context is going to become really, really important. So y hat, remember, predicted um, y value is equal to a plus bx. Now, that kind of like butts heads with what we learned in algebra because usually the y-intercept was given as a b value in algebra but in stats we like to use this form and we want to kind of keep it consistent because many of you are going to go on in stats so we're going to use that same form plus you know on the ap exam so a is what they use for the y-intercept and they actually write it right away in the equation which i think is beautiful because what is the y-intercept well it's the, the beginning value of your data when time has not surpassed right it's the beginning value so it makes sense to me in math to begin with it um, and then B is what they use for slope. I'll be honest, guys. Uh, other countries don't use M for slope. That's just a wee thing in America. So B actually makes a lot more sense uh, because of the polynomial regression. All right, so B is the slope, and it's the predicted value. And remember, we know about slope, right? It's the change in Y over the change in X. So in this particular case, it's the predicted value of Y as it changes when X is increased by one unit. Because you're going to notice our slopes are typically decimals. So that means their denominator, right, is always a 1. So that same Ford F-150 problem, let's interpret the slope of the regression line. And then we're also going to answer, does it have, um, does the value of y, the of the y-intercept have any meaning in the context? And if so, interpret it. Sometimes the y-intercept really doesn't matter for the problem, for the context of the problem. Uh, spoiler alert, this is not one of those times. <laughs> so the slope. The slope is in front of the um, explanatory variable, so in front of what would have been the x. So our slope is negative 0.1629. So the interpretation of that, and notice the word predicted, all right, watch that. The predicted price of a used Ford F-150 context goes down, because it's negative, by 0.1629 dollars. You could also call that cents. Uh, for each additional mile that the truck has been driven. Okay, so look at all that context. They're going to take off points on the AP exam if you don't use the, proper, the appropriate wordings. So we have to make sure that we differentiate that's a predicted price and that it's um, going down by a certain value for each additional mile that the truck has driven. So labels, 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 context, context, context. So the y-intercept... Remember, in math, in algebra, the y-intercept is, you know, where the line crosses the y-axis. It's where your line typically begins when you're graphing. Um, it's where x equals 0 is de determined as the y-intercept for models in general in math. Um, so let's interpret that for this problem. So the predicted price in dollars uh, of a used Ford F-150 that has been driven 0 miles. So brand new out of the factory, no one hasn't even touched the road yet, that's how much a brand new Ford F-150 should cost. And that does have context because, again, most of you don't go out and buy brand new cars, but, you know, when you buy a brand new car, it has a couple miles on it because they got to drive it to the truck and all that. Um, but it's brand new. So what should be the sticker price of a brand new Ford F-150? That's what this context would mean. So brand new Ford F-150 4x4, according to our model, um, is predicted to cost $38,257. All right, when asked to interpret the slope of the y-intercept, very important that we have the word predicted or something equivalent to predicted in your response. Okay, otherwise, and this is a big source of um, point loss on the AP exam, 
If they aren't certain that you understand that the regression equation is a prediction and not an actual value, they're going to take off points, or I guess not give you points. So here's a check your understanding from the book. We have some data. Oh, those rats are back. All right, so we're going to interpret the slope of the regression line, and then we're going to ask if the y-intercept has meaning in the context, and if so, interpret it. So pause the video. I'm about to show you the answers. So first, an interpretation of the slope. So the slope is 40, right? That's not an interpretation, though. Here we go. The predicted weight of the rat goes up 40 grams for each increase of one week in the rat's age. So using the phrase predicted weight, and then the context goes up by 40 grams for every increase of one week in the rat's age. I know there's other ways to say that sentence. That felt a little bumbly to me. Um, but they're going to be looking for certain markers here. So then the y-intercept, they're saying, yes, it definitely has meaning in the context. Because when x equals 0, that means a, it's a brand new baby rat. It's a newborn rat, right? Zero weeks. So the, again, predicted weight must be 100 grams, according to this uh, model. Is that true? I don't know, because again, I don't know anything about rats. All right, this means that we, um, this would be the end of the first day's lesson. So if you're looking for that, you can stop here. Otherwise, I'm going to keep going. So the least squares regression line. So we've talked about regression lines, and now they're throwing in this other part of the word, uh, the phrase least squares. So there's many different lines that we could use to model the association of the scatter plot. A good regression line will make the residuals as small as possible. So, um, I've recorded a lot of lessons, so I think we've talked about, you know, correlation and is it a good fit and all that already. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to want our regression line to minimize the sum of the squared residuals. So what they've done is they've taken all the residuals, remember those vertical lines that show how far off they are from, from the prediction, and they square them. So in math, when we square something, we do this a lot in stats, it's because we want to get rid of the signage of it, a negative becomes a positive. So they want these error squares, if you want to call it that, to be as small as possible because that means we have a good fit. So mathematically, they figured out how to do this um, and how to measure it, which is more important. So the sum of the squares of the residuals as small as possible. That's the, that's the goal here. Now, do not get hung up on how they do this. Your job is to interpret the technological outputs. So we're going to be using a little bit of technology to find our own, and then eventually I'm just going to show you some other outputs that you might see on the AP exam, and then I'm going to help you interpret that. So we have some data here. Those Ford F-150s are back. Here's the actual data, uh, miles driven, and then the price. So remember, the explanatory variable was the miles driven, and then the price is the um, response variable. So on our calculator, what we would do first is we would enter our data into L1 and L2. So remember, stat, edit, um, miles go into L1, make sure you go in order, and then um, price data goes into L2, again, in the same order. By the way, in your book, there is a little, like, uh, video symbol. You can watch a video of all the steps on the calculator in that video. So then, to calculate the line, we're going to go to stat, and this, this time we go over to calc, and we're going to choose lin, lin reg A plus BX. We want to stay consistent with that usage of the formula. There's actually two different linear regressions you'll see, but pick the one that says A plus BX. And um, in some other TI-8384s, you'll see B sub naught plus B sub 1X. It's the exact same thing. Um, mm -hmm. Now, in our newer calculators, which we do have at our school, you're going to have some other prompts. So X is list 1, Y is list 2, if you followed what I did. Um, the frequency list, there is none for our data, so leave that blank, leave it empty. And then it says to leave the store regression equation blank. I think in class I'm going to show you guys actually how to store it in the Y1, just because I, I like to have it there, just in case I want it later. Um, and then we choose calculate. So this is for that newer operating system that our TI-84 CEs have. And if you've got an older calculator, one of those gray or black ones that's, you know, from a while ago, does the same stuff. You just got to pick the right prompt. And then it always assumes you want list one, list two, so you actually don't have to do this step. Um, but it's a good habit to write which two lists you're pulling the data from. Either way, you're going to get this information. Now, I believe we learned in the last lesson that if your R value, your correlation co coefficient is not showing up, um, you have to turn that on in the catalog diagnostics on. Oh, right here.
<laughs> if R and R squared, maybe I'm like totally making this up. Maybe I've never taught this to you. I can't remember, guys. Oh, too many videos going on. So if R squared and R do not appear on the screen, these are the steps you got to take. So on our newer calculators, it suggests you just go to mode and then stat diagnostics and turn it on. Easy peasy. If you have an older calculator, you're going to go to what's called the catalog, which is second zero. And then alf everything's alphabetical. So go down until you see diagnostics on and then hit enter twice to execute the command. Now, once your diagnostics are on, it's going to stay on until you turn it off or reset it. So it's like reset to factory settings. So you shouldn't have to do this again. That's the good news. <laughs> Unless you're messing with your calculator, I guess. All right. Now, this is where, again, I'm going to differ a little bit in class because they didn't have you store your regression equation in Y1, and I think we should. Because if we don't store the regression equation and I have to type it, usually they're really gross regression equations, like lots of decimal places. So you might have a different looking final answer if you truncate or round your regression equation that your calculator comes up, comes up with. You'll notice here, like, you know, here's the um, slope and here's the y-intercept. Well, if you rounded this to like 0.14 and you rounded this to 0.1, negative 0.163 or something, you're going to get a different final answer when you actually go to use that equation. Not a huge deal in stats because we kind of take any answer, but I know in your pre-calc class for my students, um, you got to be real accurate. All right. So what if I wanted a picture of the scatter plot with the regression line uh, together? Well, we got to make sure the equation is in y equals, so whether you stored it or you hand wrote it in there, whatever. Um, and then don't forget to hit zoom stat to make sure that it adjusts the window so it's appropriate for your scatter plot. So we'll do lots of that in class. Don't get hung up on the technology. But like I said, in your textbook, they have um, a video that goes through all the ideas of the keystrokes you got to hit. All right. How do we determine if the linear model is appropriate? Well, residual plots is a great way to determine that. So we know what a residual is. It's the vertical difference between the actual value and the prediction line. So a residual plot is a scatter plot that displays all the residuals on a vertical axis versus the explanatory variable on the horizontal axis. So like for a truck example, you know, what's the residual at, um, you know, 50,000 miles, 51,000 miles, 52,000 miles, and so on and so on. So two scatter plots, the actual data is on the left, and on the right you have what's called a residual plot. You don't have to ever do this by hand. That's the good news. Your calculator will do it for you. But what we're looking for in a residual plot, and this is really interesting, you're looking for a non-predictive hot mess. So you want your dots everywhere, like all over the place. There's no pattern of any sort. You don't see them going like positive, negative, positive, negative. They're just all over the place. If you have a hot mess, the answer is yes, you have a good plot. <laughs> all right, so let's take, um, well, here's some more factors here. The residual plot should show no obvious patterns and the residuals should be relatively small in size. So you shouldn't have like gigantic residuals jumping all over the place. So here's some examples of uh, not good residual plots. This means a linear model is not appropriate for either one of these. Um, you see that there is a, a bit of a pattern. <laughs> so we'll, we'll learn later that, you know, linear regression is not the only way for us to model data. Um, in these particular cases, linear regression just wasn't right. You might notice the guy on the left looks a little familiar. It looks like a quadratic, eh? All right. So to determine whether it's appropriate, um, we look at the residual plot. That's a great way to do it. So there's that truck problem again. Here it says residual plot. Because there's no obvious leftover pattern once we plot the residuals against the explanatory, that means the linear model was appropriate. I'm not saying it's like super awesome at predicting it 100%, but at least linear was the appropriate type of regression to use. Again, we haven't learned the other types of regression yet. They're coming up next, um, like in another lesson, but they do exist. So that's something we got to think about before we learn the next lesson. So here's an example. Again, you can hit that little play button and, and see a video of it. That Ford F-150 stuff, we're going to be, excuse me, we're going to be creating residual plots using technology. We already have our data in our calculator. That's wonderful. So the only other thing we have to do now is go to our stat plot and adjust it so it gives me the residual plot instead of the traditional scatter plot. So for x list, 
I still want list one, the explanatory variable, but for the Y list, I want the residuals. Now the residual command, you'll have to go get it. It's found in what's called the list menu. So there's a button list. Um, you get that by hitting second stat. And then you'll see R-E-S-I-D, -S stands for residuals. So choose that while your cursor is in the Y list area. And then don't forget to um, hit zoom stat, zoom nine, and you'll see the residual plot. So no discernible pattern. The residuals are not like gigantic, so I'm feeling good. Um, you'll notice you can like hop around the residuals if you needed to see what the actual values were, or you could actually at this point go to the window and see what it shows for an appropriate window. All right, so we're going to check our understanding now. We're going to calculate the equation of the least squares regression line using a calculator. We're going to make a residual plot again on the calculator, and then we're going to decide whether that linear relationship model was appropriate for this data. So pause the video, write down some thoughts, give it a try. All right, so calculator, what they did is they entered their data. I should go back a minute. They entered um, body weight into list one and backpack weight into list two. And then they went and pulled up the um, regression equation command for A plus BX. That's the one they used. And this is the equation they found where Y hat is the predicted backpack weight and X equals body weight. No, notice, and this gets confusing for kids, they didn't use the word predicted for body weight. We're not predicting body weight. We're predicting the Y variable, right? We're predicting the backpack weight. I feel like I said something backwards there. No, we're good. Okay. So that was from the calculator. We had to round and truncate, obviously. So for part two, the residual plot, also from the calculator, they still use list one as their X variable. And then in, list, in uh, the Y, they pulled up the residual command. So what they're going to say here, and they actually calculated the residuals for you over here by hand. This is not something that I would make you do necessarily. We would just pull it up on the calculator. Um, it does say here, there appears to be a negative, positive, negative pattern. This is a little hard for kids to like see. There's some toggling, you know, kind of, um, you know, negative, positive, but this is kind of confusing because it goes more positive, negative, positive, kind of centered. <laughs> it seems to toggle above and below that line of zero. So they're claiming that a linear model is probably not appropriate for this data. I don't think I'm going to be that sneaky with you. I think when we give you residual plots, it's either going to be like horribly, obviously a hot mess, um, or it's going to look very obviously curved, like a quadratic or a logarithm or something. Okay, blue box means this is the end of day two. We're going to do lots of examples in class. This is just kind of an overview. All right, halfway, here goes, day three. <laughs> How well does the line fit the data? So what's this S and R squared? Well, I think we've seen S before. Uh, I think we might be surprised as to what S really stands for here. So to assess how well the line fits the data, Besides looking at the residual plot, the plot is just telling us whether linear is appropriate. Now we're going to decide how appropriate is it. Um, we need to consider the residuals for each observation, not just one. So using these residuals, we can estimate the typical prediction error using a least squares regression line. So that's what S is. We know S typically stands for standard deviation, but in this case, it's standard deviation of the residuals. So the typical distance of the residual they call it prediction error. All right, so it measures the typical distance between the actual y, y values and the predicted y values. Now the math, not important. We're not going to make you do those by hand, okay? That comes from the calculator. Your job is to interpret it. Now the other thing the calculator gives you is an r squared value. So r squared, which is definitely related to r, it is simply the square of r, um, this is called the coefficient of determination, and this concept is kind of hard for kids to wrap their brain around because they're like, what? <laughs> like R, for some reason, makes lots of sense because we associate it with slope when we first learn it. And then they're like, what happens when you square slope? Well, it's not quite what we're doing here. So the coefficient of determination measures the percent reduction in the sum of squares residuals, squared residuals when using the least squares regression line to make a prediction rather than the mean value of Y. So rather than just averaging all the Y's and saying like, oh, how'd you do? Um, they are 
seeing how much you can reduce the sum of the squared errors, right? The residuals were the errors if we were to use this prediction line. So we're going to have a little like a formula almost for how we write these answers. And we're just going to kind of stick to that formula. So in other words, R squared measures the percent of the variability in the response variable that is accounted for by the least squares regression line. So basically, the least squares regression line is going to fix all of that variability for the response variable by a certain value, and that's called the coefficient of determination. Um, it tells us how much better the least squares regression line does at predicting values of y than simply just guessing from the mean y. Because means are lame, right? That's that's not cool math. We can do better than that. All right, Ford F Ford F one fifty data. All right, it's back. It's here. So using our technology, they found out that the standard deviation of the residuals was fifty seven forty. Notice positive, uh, and then R squared is 0.66. So interpret S and then interpret R squared. So for S, oops, I keep forgetting to use my clicker here. Oops, there we go. Uh, the actual price of a Ford F-150 is typically about 5740 away from the predicted price of the least squares regression line with um, X miles driven. Now notice this time they don't give you any sort of context for miles driven because it's not for one particular point. It's for all the data in general using the least squares regression line. Now interpreting R squared. So about 66% of the variability in the price of the Ford F-150, so remember price was the, the response variable, is accounted for by the least squares regression line with x equals miles driven. So the context there was important. They were specific about the 66% of the variability. So that's kind of part of the formula that we're going to use for answers. Um, blah, blah, blah. And then some, oh, here we go. That's what I was looking for. This, my friends, this is a template we're going to be using. So the stuff that's bolded and underlined is what you're going to keep replacing with stuff from the problem. So blank of the variation in the blank can be explained by the linear relationship with the blank. Okay, so I didn't specifically say least squares regression line. In this case, we just said the linear relationship. They are synonymous for our purposes. If you wanted to say least squares regression line, you go for it. All right, so this is where you're going to see problems that you actually will face on the AP exam. You're going to have interpret, you're going to be asked to interpret computer output. So statistical software will throw out a bunch of information at you and you have to kind of figure out what you're looking at and actually translate it in reference to the context of the problem. That's what makes this tricky. So this is a mini tab. Um, and actually, I'm going to have you guys watch a great video from our friend who Gosh, I'm like blanking on his name all of a sudden. Wonderful man who does the skew the script. Shout out to him. Oh my gosh, blanking. Anywho, he does a great explanation of how we can think through this. Now I'm the first person to say like, I'm really bad at memorizing stuff. So when I start to pull apart things like this, rather than memorizing, I just stop and think, oh, well that makes sense if I think about it for what it truly is. Like I never memorize formulas well, but if I thought about how the formula worked, I was fine things like that. So there's he's going to tell you in his video um, that we already know S represents the standard deviation of the residuals. So that's not new. The R square literally says R square down there. You see it? So that is the value for R squared. Shock, I know. But up here, so we have the constant. And remember, constant, think about it in algebra. That's the y-intercept portion of the linear equation, right? It's the constant. There's no variable with it. But then down here, miles driven, he has a coefficient because he's in front of the explanatory variable, right? That's what math coefficients mean. So you should be able to pull out the slope and the y-intercept if you just kind of stop and think. Now, I know you're looking at all these other stuff, things and you're like, what is all this? Don't worry about it. We don't need to worry about that for um, interpreting some computer outputs for our purposes. So here um, we have a different type of software, JMP. I'll be honest, guys, I really don't know what that stands for, but that's okay. Same idea. So you'll see some pretty obvious things. Like, for instance, up at the top there, it says R squared. Well, that means R squared. And then don't worry about the adjusted one. But underneath there, you'll notice it says root mean square error. 
Well, that is a very fancy way of saying standard deviation of the residuals. Okay, so that's the S. Now towards the bottom where they talk, start to talk about the parameter estimators, um, the intercept is very clear. So that's the y-intercept. And underneath that, it says miles driven estimate. That's the, um, that confuses me as a reader because I think miles driven, like that's not what slope represents. Miles driven, remember, is the explanatory variable. And if I kind of think about it in math, you know, that would, that's what would be next to my explanatory variable. That's how I remember that one. I mean, hey, it helps that we already know the answer to this question. We can pull them out a little easier. So here's a, a good example of what you might see on the AP exam. A computer output, boom, here you go. It's about Old Faithful Geyser and Yellowstone. And it shows um, that Y represents the interval of time until the next eruption measured in minutes. X represents the duration of the most recent eruption, again, in minutes for Old Faithful in a particular month. So they want us to probably do some stuff. So here's, you're going to want to pause the video and look through this in a moment, but they're going to ask you to answer these four questions. So now would be a good time to pause the video and jot down your thoughts. So the first question says, what is the equation of the least squares regression line? So remember for an equation, we just need the y-intercept and the slope. So if we go back here, intercept, boom, slope, boom. So right there. Notice y hat is what's being used, and they, of course, had to round. So 33.347 plus 13.2, okay, I'm not sure why they chose to round so weirdly, but whatever. I was alone. That clearly wasn't looking at sig figs. I don't know if it even matters. We're stats. We don't care about sig figs. All right, now notice the context here, where x represents the duration of the most recent eruption in minutes, and y hat is the underline here, predicted interval of time until the next eruption measured in minutes. All right, so question two, they ask us to interpret the slope of the least squares regression line. So remember slope, we know it's change in y over change in x, but we need to put it in context and make sure we use that magic word predicted when appropriate. So our slope, remember it's 13.2854, so it's, we interpret it as the predicted interval of time until the next eruption goes up, because it's positive, by 13.284 minutes for each increase of one minute in the duration of the most recent eruption. So remember the x part of the slope is always measuring as one because we never write it as a fraction so it's always over one. Context, not predicted, right? Just the in the duration of the most recent eruption. The predicted part is with the y component. Okay, watch that. All right, next question. Identify and interpret the standard deviation of the residuals. Well, that should be given to us here. So the root mean square error, 6.493357. So the, the, again, interpretation says the actual interval of time until the next eruption, measured in minutes, is typically about 6.49 minutes away from the predicted time. There's no direction there, it's just saying away, because if you remember the formula for S was, there's some squares in there. Um, and again, they continue on with the context. So just watch your language on this one, where the actual interval of time is typically this uh, minutes away from the predicted time. And then the last one is, of course, find and interpret the R-squared coefficient of determination. So um, the R-squared is 85.4%. If I look at that output that came from this top one right here. So that means 85.4% of the variability in the interval is accounted for by the least squares regression line with X equaling the duration. That's, I'm going to be honest. I stole it from the book. I don't really love that answer because um, it didn't really use our format that we've been talking about. So I would say something like 85.4% of the variability in the uh, interval until the next eruption is accounted for by the linear relationship with um, the duration of the most recent eruption. Okay, that was a lot of words. I kind of wish I wrote that down. That was golden. All right, good news or bad news? I don't know, but that's the end of day three. Um, there's a little bit more though. So here we go, last part of this lesson. Calculating regression equation if you all you have is summary statistics. Oh my. 
So here's what's going to happen in this next part. I don't want you to get bogged down on why. For now, just focus on the how. Um, I will go into a short explanation of why, meaning like W-H-Y-Y. But don't get bogged down. Like I said, don't freak out if you're like, I don't get that part. That's not the important part. That's not the takeaway here. So using technology is often most convenient to find the equation. Of course. But you could technically find the equation of a least squares regression line if you have the summary statistics. So I could see this being an AP question. They're, I'm going to be honest, guys. They're not excited to find out that you're a button pusher on a calculator. What they're excited about is can you interpret what the calculator gives you and can you work with it? So someone took all of the cool formulas that we have and they rearranged them so that way we could find a slope and a y-intercept and use that to come up with our equation. So again, don't get bogged down on the how. This is just uh, the why. This is just how we're going to use it. So the slope, which remember we're calling B, that can be calculated by taking your R, your correlation factor, right, R, and multiplying it by the standard deviation of the Y's over the standard deviation of the X's. Wow. Because you think about, you know, X's and Y's are in their, their own little list in the calculator, right? So if you could find the average X and the average Y, and you can find the standard deviation of the X and the standard deviation of the Y, you can actually calculate slope of the least squares regression line. And then the y-intercept, again, someone did the math, the rearranging, but it's calculated by taking the mean y, subtracting the slope that you just found, times the mean x. Well, that's just fantastic. All right, so let's see that in action. Oh, before we move on to an example, though. Um, this formula for slope reminds us the distinction between explanatory and response variables and how important it is. And the least squares regression makes the distances of the data points from the line small only in the y direction. Okay. Um, now, there's a big note here, and I stole this from your book, I'll be honest. It says if we reverse the roles of the two variables, the values of, uh-oh, I lost my thing. Um, <laughs> it's supposed to say x and y, x bar and y bar, will reverse in the slope formula, and that'll give you a totally different regression line. So notice in our calculator, when we calculate it, it always asks us, like, who's your X and who's your Y? And if you invert those lists, you're going to get a very different answer. But what's kind of cool is switching the X and Y around is not going to change the value of R. So keep that in mind. All right, here is an example. So we're going to be calculating the least squares regression line from summary statistics. So we are... Um, what we got here, a random sample of 15 high school students investigate the relationships between their foot length and their height. So the mean and standard deviation of foot lengths are, and they already calculated the summary, but the mean is 24.76, standard deviation of 2.71, that was for foot lengths. And then when they measured their heights, their average height was 171.43 with a devi standard deviation of 10.69 centimeters. The correlation, again, given to you, is 0.697. Find the equation of the least squares of regression line, and then use some, that equation to make a prediction, maybe. Or well, maybe not. Back up, Bruzo. All right, so using that formula from the previous slide, to find slope, all you need to do is take your correlation and multiply it by the standard deviation of y over the standard deviation of x. So they plugged in those values, and they got 2.75. So for the y-intercept, we find that, using that formula from before, by taking y bar, the average y, minus the slope we just found, times x bar. So when they calculated that, they got a y-intercept of 103.34. So plugging and chugging into that least squares regression equation, which we know is just, you know, slope-intercept form, uh, they use a plus bx form, so 103.34 plus 2.75x. So that's kind of neat. You don't actually have to have all the data. If you have the summary statistics, you can work backwards and find the equation. That would be something I might have you do for homework. These next few slides are explaining a little bit more about why this works out. Okay. So this is the, the basis for regression to the mean. What we have here is uh, we have a scatter plot that's showing the relationship between the foot length and the height for those students that you know we were just referring to in that previous question along with uh, lines that show x bar and y bar and also a what is a value oh sorry of one standard deviation above each mean so one deviation above x bar and y bar all right let's take a look at this 
it's kind of small, so hopefully your screen's big enough. So this light blue line, the least squares regression line, cool, cool. All right, <laughs> this, I think it's purple line here, this is X bar. And then this line that's to the right of it, I think it's green, this is X bar plus one standard deviation in the X direction. Okay, so similarly, they plotted a line at Y bar, average Y, and then above that in red, this is Y bar plus standard one standard deviation of Y. And here's what they want to point out to you. I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. For every one, uh, for an increase of one standard deviation in the X direction, the least squares regression line predicts an increase of only R standard deviations in the Y direction. This is what they want you to point out to yourself, I guess. If I go one deviation up in the X direction, I don't go a full deviation up in the Y direction. You see that? This red line would have been one full deviation. I didn't go that far. And remember, this particular line did not have a correlation factor of one exactly. It had something lower, like 60 something percent. So that's going to lead us into our next idea. Um, oh, this is, <laughs> this is kind of their moment to hook you, okay? This is called regression to the mean because the y, the values of y regress to their mean. Okay. They fall back towards their mean a little bit. They're not going to get up to the y plus standard deviation. All right. All right. Full disclosure, stole this straight out of your book, like took a screenshot and everything. So there's a close connection between the correlation and the slope of the regression line. So remember, this is the formula that we are working with where slope was r times standard deviation of y over standard deviation x. And then in the other part of the formula here, where they like said equals something else, all they did was slide the r up into the numerator. Nothing crazy there. So this equation says that along the regression line, a change of one standard deviation in x uh, corresponds to a change of r standard deviations in the y. So if you think about the r being with the standard deviation of y, and then there's nothing down here with the standard deviation of x, so we know there's like a secret 1 there. If the variables are perfectly correlated, meaning r is 1 or negative 1, so it's an exactly a line, just wonderful, the change for the predicted response in y hat is the same as the change in x. So you'll see 1 deviation, 1 deviation. That is not what we saw in our example, right? It went over one deviation for x, but it didn't go up one deviation for y because we were not perfectly correlated. All right, where did I leave off? Um, for example, if r equals 1 and x is two standard deviations above x bar, then that means y hat will be two stand de standard deviations above y bar. All right, clever. But here's what we know. r is not typically 1. Usually r is between negative 1 and 1. So you'll see like 0 0.89, 0 0.72. So because of that, um, the change in y hat is less than the change in x. Um, because remember, we're multiplying the change in y by r. So if you multiply by a number that's smaller than 1, you're going to shrink that number down. So to illustrate that property, let's return to the foot length example. Okay, <laughs> so I think I'm going to skip this part, guys. This is not as exciting as I thought it would be. It says when a student's foot length is one standard deviation above the mean, uh, the predicted height, y hat, is above mean height, y bar, but not entirely one standard deviation. We kind of already talked about that, didn't we? So I'm going to skip to this part. In other words, for an increase of one standard deviation of, in the y, sorry, in the value of the explanatory variable x, the least squares regression line predicts an increase of only r standard deviations in the response variable. I think that's the key takeaway. Because r is not typically 1 or negative 1, it's going to not go up by a full deviation in the y direction for every 1 in the x direction. And that's the idea of it regressing to their mean. And then they give you a little history lesson, because what's a stats lesson without a little history lesson? Sir Francis Galton. Uh, is often credited with discovering the idea of regression to the mean. And he looked at data on the heights of children versus the heights of their parents. And he found that taller than average parents tended to have children who were taller than average, but they weren't quite as tall as their parents. So they kind of, you know, the next generation regressed back to the average height of the, the population. They, they weren't producing like super duper tall parents or children. Likewise, shorter than average parents 
tended to have children who were shorter than average, but not quite as short as their parents. So they weren't quite ex as extreme, huh? So Galton used the symbol R for the correlation because of its important relationship to the regression. So that's why I think a lot of times in math, we're like, why are they using this to represent that? Well, because some dude along the way was like, hey, here's my discovery, and I want to call it R. So thanks, Galton. All right, correlation and regression wisdom. Correlation and regression are powerful tools for describing the relationship between two variables. When you use these tools, you should be aware of their limitations, and this is going to be key. All right, clicker, are you working? There we go. Correlation and regression lines describe only linear relationships. So we saw before with the residual plots, if we can't describe it as a linear relationship, then we're not going to use these words. So you'll see some examples here where, um, like that second one, this guy right here, has a pretty high correlation number, but clearly that is not linear, right? So that wouldn't really be appropriate. Um, this scatter plot Kind of a hot mess, but you know, the correlation value is pretty good. This one almost looks like a perfect line, and then there's this crazy outlier. Um, and then this, <laughs> this is a real hot mess. This is a vertical line. And if I were to actually plot this regression line, 3 plus 0.5x, you know, it would look something like this. It wouldn't come close to any of those points. Maybe that one that's way out there, that outlier. Although I don't really know that he's an outlier. I don't know what's going on with that data. So the problem is, because some of this data wasn't really linear, it wasn't appropriate for us to like rely on just the correlation number. Sometimes kids mistake, like, oh, I have a good R number. That means it must be a good fit. Not always. we got to look at the shape and the residuals. Ah, here's some good vocab for us. Points with high leverage in regression have a much larger or much smaller X value than all the other points in the data set. So I think of this as like, not it's not the same thing as an outlier. Um, it's something that's very far down the scale. Okay, An outlier in a regression point is a point that does not follow the pattern or of the data or has a large residual. So you could be kind of within the data set, like in the X's, in that domain, if you want to call it that, but like way off in no man's land. And that's called an outlier. An influential point um, is any point in a regression that, if we remove it, substantially changes the slope, the y-intercept, or the correlation, or the coefficient of determination, or the standard deviation of the residuals. So what we're going to find out is that high leverage and outliers are considered influential points. Um, there's different types, and we have to kind of determine what's going to go on here. And we're going to also find out that you can be a high, a high leverage and an outlier. So that's confusing. All right, here it goes. So here we have some examples of scatter plots. Um, and we have the age at, was, at which a child said their first words. And uh, what does that say? The gazelle score. I don't know what that is. Probably some intelligence score. All right, so we have this data. And then we also have the residual plots over here. So for child 18, this guy out here, or girl, or they. It, this is considered a high leverage point because everybody else was in this area as far as the X's. And then here's child 18. So that's considered a high leverage point, not an outlier. But look at child 19. 19 is within that domain of all the other values. So this child learned their first word at about the same age as everybody else, um, but has a very high gazelle score, whatever that means. Okay. Now notice what happens when they start removing data points. So this is super tiny. I need a bigger screen here. This bluish purple line is how the least squares regression line changes if you remove child 18. Remember child 18 was the high leverage point child. So it significantly changed. Come on, buddy. It significantly changed. Um, the slope, it made the slope closer to a zero, um, flattened out the line, if you want to think of it that way. It lessened the y-intercept, and it slightly increased the standard deviation of the residuals, the s. So this is the original, and then here's the with child 18 removed. Now, that was when they removed the high leverage point child. What happens when they, oh, and greatly decreased r squared. 
So there you go. Now remember, r squared is not something we want to decrease, so keep that in mind. What happens if we remove child 19? So child 19 was what we considered an outlier. It barely changed the slope. It barely changed the y-intercept. But it greatly decreased the standard deviation of the residuals, and it increases r squared, so gave us a, a better fitting uh, linear model, if you want to think of it that way. So these are things we got to think about, you know, who, which data point do we need to eliminate and why, or is it appropriate? And again, there's a video um, from, oh my God, never heard of <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, he has a great explanation illustrating, you know, high leverage versus outliers. And also, when do you have a high leverage and an outlier at the same time? That's kind of crazy. All right, we've talked about this before. Correlation and regression are powerful tools to describe relationships between two variables. But you have to be careful of limitations. Like, for instance, association does not imply causation. We're just noting a relationship as one increases, so does the other. We can't say it's caused by one or the other at this point. So when we study the relationship between two variables, we often hope to show changes in the explanatory variable cause changes in the response variable. Um, but strong association between two variables is not enough to say that's the cause and effect. I know, it's tempting. All right, well, that's the end. So we definitely are going to go back and look at more examples about these high leverage and outliers because I think that's probably a muddy area for everyone. Um, just get the vocab down for now, and we'll look at more of that in class. All right, that was an exhausting hour of my life. Goodbye, everybody.